Excited to get to present uh, on behalf of Johnson & Johnson Vision a little bit about ocular surface disease and some protocol and share with you some of my perspectives around dry eye and specifically meibomian gland dysfunction. My name is David Kading and I practice in Seattle, Washington and uh, do want to let you know that uh, this presentation is being put on uh, on behalf of Johnson & Johnson and their surgical division and uh, which also includes their dry eye division. The activity that we're discussing is educational, uh, it promotional and is uh, something that I'm being compensated to present to you. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited for this presentation. Anytime I get the opportunity to speak about meibomian gland dysfunction, uh, I, I, I absolutely love it. It's a concept that has become very near and dear to my heart. Now dating about uh, 10 years uh, that we have been uh, functioning in our practice with um, meibomian gland dysfunction treatments and the evolution up to eight years ago when we brought in the lippy flow system into our practice. Today's presentation, I'm going to talk about meibomian gland dysfunction, its overview, some protocols, and how we have implemented uh, lippy flow and thermal pulsation into our practice. I, uh, as I mentioned, I practice in Seattle, Washington. I have three practices that I get to be a part of. I am the clinic director and CEO of Specialty Eye Care Group, and we have a division of our practice that is dry eye and contact lens specialty, and I have a residency that was part of it, and so I get to work with a young up-and-comer every single year and get to, uh, get to share and mentor with them and learn so much in the process where we review uh, literature articles and we do uh, research and, and studies and so forth. And uh, we also have binocular vision and pediatrics in my practice, which my wife takes a part in. And I know I have met many of you over the years and, uh, and uh, have, have spoken about contact lenses or dry eye in, in those presentations. As we look to the definition of what is dry eye, I, I, I would challenge you to say, let's go to five people and find the same definition of what dry eye is and what it is encompassing for us. And for me personally, over the years, that definition it continues to evolve. But for the last four or five years, working with my mentor, I've adopted her, her definition. And that is when the ocular surface system fails to protect itself from desiccating stress. And that's when we have dry eye as a disease. You know, I jump on an airplane, I fly to a very arid climate, and my eyes are uncomfortable. That's dry eyes, but it's not dry eye disease. But when the body is no longer able to overwhelm itself with solutions and fixing the problems, when it is, uh, it is, is, is no longer able to compensate for that desiccating stress, we then have a dry eye disease state. And our objective as eye care providers is to really slow down that process as much as we can by reducing the desiccating stressful environment, but you know you can't change the weather. Uh, maybe reducing the airflow that is in the environment, we can have our patients turn down the fans that are in the room, um, you know, limit screen time, encourage people to blink, reduce their contact lens wear. But things like daily contact lens wear are things that patients are going to continue to do. Those are desiccating stressful environments. A patient going in for a surgical procedure is a desiccating stressful episode. And really, we're, we're, uh, we're tasked with uh, a, a finding these, these problems that are causing the desiccating stress and finding the solutions that we can really get to. And overwhelmingly throughout the years, we've, we've really come to understand that a major hallmark of dry eye disease and that failure to protect the eye from desiccating stress comes from our patients not having the appropriate lipid layer. As we know, the lipid layer is made up of 
oils that are produced from the meibomian glands. We, we know the aqueous from the lacrimal glands. We know mucin and, and goblet cells. And, you know, that, that formula that makes up the tear film itself. And it's built upon this foundational roof of the lipid layer that helps to, uh, helps to prevent evaporation and creates this, this lubricious surface for the eyelid to slide across. But a, a key component of this as well is that it performs as a barrier function. And I, I think of that term barrier function as, as being a term that we utilize a lot in, in corneal pathology. And, uh, you know, we, we, we should get eye infections every single day, but the cornea has an incredible barrier function that prevents microorganisms that are in the tears to get through the cornea to cause a infectious condition, that barrier function. And we need to have that outer defense that can really, uh, really pacify most of the the uh, things that are bombarding the ocular surface. And that's the key component of the lipid layer of the tear film to lubricate, to prevent evaporation and to, prevent, and, and to act as a barrier for the rest of the ocular surface. And I think that's a key component that we fail to realize about the importance of the ocular surface and that lipid layer. Now, when, when we think about meibomian gland dysfunction, I, I thought I knew what MGD was 10 years ago. I traveled around the world and was in several different continents and countries lecturing about dry eye and what it really was. And my, my, my quest and evolution within dry eye really, really morphed as I started digging more into what MGD was. I took a step back and I said, you know, my contact lens patients are dropping out of their lenses just as much as everybody else. Maybe I don't know as much about dry eye as I think I do. And we need to dig into the literature and really reevaluate what I was taught in school and reevaluate what we're, what we're teaching people about dry eye. And this particular image uh, is, is something that has has really helped me. And you can find this image in the International Workshop on Meibomian Gland Dysfunction Report, uh, which was published in 2011. It's a, a rich, long report, uh, but a very, very uh, robust discussion around MGD. And in this anatomical figure, we see the simplicity of the eyelid. Obviously, it's much more complex than this, but the simplistic nature of it really helps us understand the functional blink. And I'm going to speak again about the functional blink in a moment, but I want to reference for us how mybum is released from the eyelid when a patient is blinking. And that is the force and the action of a blink causes the abicularis to start squeezing in on the eyelid. The inner eyelid is in opposition to the globe and the movement is really causing by the abicularis to bring this, this blink up. And as it is coming up, it's also pushing in upon the tarsal plate, which isn't referenced in the image here. That tarsal plate starts squeezing in upon the, uh, upon the asini, which are those little tiny grape pods that you see here. And those grape pods look kind of like this image that you see at the top right-hand corner of the screen where they uh, it, it, where where they create what's called a, a mybocyte. And the mybocytes are actually cells. The meibomian gland itself is a holocrine gland, which creates a cell, and that cell starts to transition and morph. And as the cells morph, it becomes mybum. As that mybum is then going through this duct, this long duct, it transitions from a mybocyte into mybum, and it begins this upward pressure. The eyelid continues to put that pressure, the abicularis upon the tarsal plate, and it's starting to squeeze that mybum up the central duct. But never once have I ever sat at the slit lamp and seen oil just popping up from the surface. 
And the reason for that is another really important muscle that I don't remember learning in school. Maybe, maybe y'all did, but that's Ryland's muscle. And Ryland's muscle is, is kind of this, this sphincter muscle. And Ryland's muscle does not really open itself until the eyelids touch each other or get really close to each other. And when the eyelids touch each other, Ryland's muscle opens and it causes this oil secretion to be slid up onto the eyelid. The upper eyelid then is able to grab a hold of this excessive lipid that is, that is on the eyelid surface and it draws it up over the ocular surface. And that's the process that we have. So the blink is a really, really critical component of this. Ryland's muscle is a really, really critical component of this. And having that entire gland open so that the mybocytes can go through their process of uh, becoming mybum so that our patients are functioning as best as they can. But our problems really start to begin when we don't blink completely. In fact, one of my other mentors, Don Korb, believes that 90% of meibomian gland dysfunction is because of an incomplete blink and the lack of a quality blink that we have. So when we blink incompletely, there's not enough pressure over the meibomian gland to release that liquid contents and cause Ryland's muscle to open. And then the eyelid doesn't go down to where that rich oil reservoir would be to be able to grab a hold of it and then draw it up. And so the eye ends up not having as much of a rich oil function. That barrier function can become broken. And then you can have evaporation of the ocular surface tears. So this incomplete blink is obviously a problem. It's of no you know, it's no surprise to any of us it, it, when, we, when we think about the reduced number of blinks. We blink 80% less when we're on a digital device. Throughout the day, our patients are, you know, constantly torturing themselves and their ocular surface by not having enough blinking that is then not creating this appropriate surface. So we need to really understand what the function of the meibomian glands are and how this process is really initiated before we really understand what dysfunction of the meibomian glands are all about. It's that expression, that pressure of the obicularis muscle on the tarsal plate that causes that oil glands to be expressed. And we know that that pressure, when we force our eyes really hard, can be up to 1.25 grams per millimeter squared of pressure. That's the functional blink uh, in, a, in a hard blink. So at most, we would want to be able to see that in a functional meibomian gland with that much pressure, oil is being secreted in a, in a fluid amount of oil is coming out of the meibomian glands in order for them to be appropriate. Now, a, a, a question that some people have is, you know, well, how many meibomian glands do you have and how many need to be functional? We know that anatomically, we have around about 30 meibomian glands on the lower and the upper eyelid that are really critical for us. Um, most of us assess the meibomian glands on the lower eyelid uh, as, as, the, as the key components that we do. Some people assess the meibomian glands on the upper eyelid, but generally if you have bad glands on the lower, you're gonna have bad glands on the upper. At least that's the assumption of most people. And a study that was done uh, by Corb and Blackie looked at, you know, what is the number of meibomian glands we need to have? And they've kind of assessed that about five or six meibomian glands that are flowing is what you need. And if you have less than that, then over time you're going to develop symptoms. Now, ideally, we would want to have more along the lines of 10 to 15 meibomian glands flowing of the 30 in order for our patients to be uh, fully functional. If they got much below 10 meibomian glands uh, yielding liquid secretions, as the literature says, then we're kind of in this gray zone, this, this, this little bit of a questioning, is the ocular surface gonna get the oil that it needs? And certainly when patients have, you know, four, five, six glands that are flowing, that's, that's really in this meibomian gland dysfunction component. 
over the years, we kind of have this question is to, you know, what is my Bowman gland dysfunction? Is it that the eyelid is red? Is it that the, you know, patient is symptomatic? Well, the reality is if you know what the meibomian gland function is, which I just described to you, that process of oil being secreted, a glands, uh, eyelids touching each other, pulling the oil up, creating the barrier function. If you know that that is function, then when that is broken, you have dysfunction. And we know it's dysfunctional when the meibomian glands are not flowing the way that they should when a proper blink or the uh, pressure of a proper blink is happening. Usually we characterize meibomian gland dysfunction is that there's gland obstruction, low secretions, and eventually gland atrophy. A patient can go through treatment and resume and not have gland obstruction and have increased secretions, but yet still have the effects of having those things that we would see with gland atrophy. But generally we see this process where the low secretions are there and they're there because of gland obstruction and without proper treatment over time, we will see gland atrophy. In, in fact, 40% of patients in practice have some sign of meibomian gland dysfunction. Those are, those are your patients and my patients. It's not just in dry eye practices. Those are standard primary care practices. And we know that if left untreated, meibomian gland dysfunction can lead to the alteration of the tear film because we've broken the barrier function that causes the rest of the tear film to be altered. It may cause the eye to have irritation, there may be inflammation, ocular surface disease, obviously. And we really kind of see that in this, in this cascade is you don't have the proper amount of oil. And so the evaporation starts to increase and tears evaporate quicker than they should. The body's natural compensation for quicker evaporation is, oh, we need more tears. And oftentimes you'll see that a patient is watering a little excessively before they start having some of these other symptoms. And they kind of say, well, I don't have dry eye. My eyes, my eyes are watering. I, I had a patient this morning, she's post cataract surgery, no symptoms of dryness at all. She just says, yes, yeah, sometimes my eyes water. I evaluated her meibomian glands and found obstruction. And she didn't have very much secretions from those glands at all. And uh, so we're bringing her back for treatment where we're going to uh, bring about some improvement to the gland flow by doing lippy flow on her. And she doesn't have any symptoms yet. That's the thing. And we wanna keep her from developing those symptoms because if she has had an excessive production of tears, we know that the next things that are going to happen could be uh, symptoms and could be inflammation uh, on the ocular surface. In fact, just like my patient, it's very common uh, that, you know, 20% of the patients who do have dry eye with MGD don't present with symptoms at all. It's, in fact, far more patients have what we reference as, uh, as non-obvious meibomian gland dysfunction. And those are patients who have uh, clear white eyes, their eyelids look perfect, the patient has no symptoms of dry eye, but when we evaluate is there obstruction and is there oil secretions flow from their eyes, in fact there isn't. And those are the patients that are really dangerous in the contact lens world particularly or presenting for surgery, is those, pa those patients are likely to develop some problems uh, very soon if we don't intervene with them earlier. You know, there is a time when our patient didn't have symptoms of dry eye, and then when they do, and several of those patients may never get rid of their symptoms of dry eye, regardless of the treatment that we put them on. They start in that vicious cascade. The critical component is 
to catch our patients as early as we can and do appropriate treatments, which resume them back to homeostasis before they enter into that vicious cycle of dry eye. And we can do that by preserving the barrier function of the lipid layer of the tears as quick as possible. How prevalent is MGD? Well, that's a question that LEMP looked at in 2011, published in 2011, evaluating about 300 patients who had dry eye, asking the question, do these patients have MGD? Do these patients have aqueous deficient dry eye? And the result from these 300 patients that were evaluated um, is as, as follows. The MGD is the most highly prevalent. 36% of the patients had this mixed combo um, about 50% of the patients that had dry eye uh, that had, had MGD alone, and then uh, about 14% of the patients had an aqueous deficiency. And add that together, we see that about 86% of patients who have dry eye have meibomian gland dysfunction. Now, in Lent's study, he used a, a smaller cohort, as you can see the, the N values here, uh, being right around 150, 160 patients of that 300. Is MGD something that we deal with every day in our AK practices, or is it just in dry eye practices? Well, the, the reality is it's everywhere. Uh, as, as, as mentioned, about 40% of the average patient that walks in the door so I have, uh, I have a, a, a company called Opt Optometric Insights, and we go in and we talk with young practitioners and optometry students and, and talk with them about what they want to do for their specialty when they're, when they're graduated and they're done in, in going into practice. Do they, do they want to do primary care or are they interested in, you know, having a glaucoma practice and, and work in a surgical center? And some of them say, you know what, I... I, I I understand the dry is an important thing, but I, I want to do posterior segment disease and not be involved very much in the ocular surface. Well, the reality is that 80% of patients who have glaucoma and are taking long-term anti-glaucoma medications, they have meibomian gland dysfunction particularly if they're utilizing a prostaglandin. And, and, and the reason for that is, is that prostaglandins have been shown to downregulate the meibomian glands and make them less effective and less productive. Now, I certainly wouldn't want those patients to go blind, but it needs to be managed. Um, when I put a patient on a glaucoma medication, even if I've never noted them as being a dry eye patient, they are a dry eye disease patient from the moment that we start treatment for glaucoma medications, and all of the things that we're going to do for them are on the offense, on the ocular surface side, because we're playing defense against glaucoma. And so our dry eye needs to be so important and such a big part of that treatment for those patients. And we, we combine those things together. We know contact lenses are a big part of dry eye. I'm going to touch on that again in a moment. And uh, as mentioned, 86% of all dry eye patients have MGD. But cataract surgery, right? We, we send patients for cataract surgery on a, on a daily basis. Millions of patients across the United States have cataract surgery every single year. And 63% of pre-cataract surgery patients have meibomian gland dysfunction. You think about the ocular surface from a cataract perspective, 50% of cataract patients with meibomian gland dysfunction don't, don't show symptoms. So they're presenting with observable signs of MGD, notably obstruction and low lipid layers, but they are symptomatic. Um, you know, they, 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 we, we know that if they proceed forward with cataract surgery, that likely they will become symptomatic. I'm going to show you a study on that here in a moment of the increased symptoms that patients have post cataract surgery if we fail to treat them at the, at the onset. All of us who are in dry eye practices or even primary care practices and send our patients for cataract surgery have seen people who come back and say, hey, my eyes are dry now. They weren't dry before cataract surgery. It's daunting to have that patient walk in the door. You walk into the room, 
two or three or four months post-surgery, um, you saw them at their one month, they were fine. And now three, four, five, six months down the road, you walk in and you're like, hey, Mrs. Jones, you're seeing so great. This is awesome. You know, your tech tells you their visual acuity is great. You walk into the room and boom, the patient beats you down because, doc, my eyes are hurting. They're so uncomfortable. What did that surgery do to me? It's, um, it's something that, you know, I've seen. I had a patient referred to me this week. Great outcome post-surgery, you know, it was wearing glasses for her entire life. And now she had cataract surgery and she had a great multifocal IOL outcome, but she was referred because she is in such pain and discomfort post-surgery. And she just wants to go back to having her cataracts and being preoperative because she wasn't in pain before. Her vision wasn't very good, but she wasn't in pain constantly. And it may be a small thing for some people, but it is a big thing for a lot of patients. Producing a healthy, stable tear film is the primary outcome when we want to deal with uh, MGD. And that's such a key component for a lot of reasons. One of them being uh, that we don't want our patients in pain post-op, but another one of them being because we want to come up with the appropriate surgical plan. There was one study uh, that looked at you know, outcomes and in a retrospective study, treating the meibomian gland dysfunction before surgery ended up changing the surgical plan in 40% of patients four out of 10 patients ended up having a different refractive IOL that was being put in place. This is such a huge thing for our cataract and, uh, and LASIK surgery centers that they're employing the treatment of meibomian gland dysfunction and doing treatments like this so that their outcomes post-operatively are more ideal, right? If you, are, if you are selling a patient on a multifocal IOL and you're having to, to, to do something to, to get more people to do multifocal IOLs or toric lenses. And that's really where, you, you know, cataract surgeries uh, for many of them are having to go because the reimbursement is, is not what it used to be. So they're doing more of those and, and they're finding out that, hey, if I don't treat the ocular surface ahead of time, if the referring physician doesn't treat the ocular surface ahead of time, I'm going to be off four out of 10 times, and I'm going to calculate the refractive correction. And as such, Ascaris and, and you know, the, the world of ophthalmology and cataract surgeons has, has really taken on meibomian gland dysfunction as a major part of what they're doing. We want to increase the satisfactions. And if we can identify and treat MGD before cataract surgery, we, we know we can do that. The studies have shown that. And patients being measured for those IOLs uh, need to be screened for MGD, even in the absence of symptoms, because as I just mentioned, 50% of them present without symptoms and they do have some issues. So let's talk about contact lenses. And that's something that's very near and dear to my heart, as, as many of you have heard me lecture before. I, uh, I started my dry eye practice because of contact lenses. I did my residency in cornea and contact lenses and then had this contact lens practice and contact lens comfort was such a key component of it. But the contact lens dropout rate has remained at about 16 to 20% every single year. 16 to 20% of all contact lens wearers drop out of contact lenses every single year. We've improved contact lens solutions. I've lectured you know, extensively over the years about different contact lens solutions that can make our patients more comfortable. I've, I've lectured extensively about new lens designs that can make our patients more comfortable. But in doing those things, I've now come to realize that we weren't focusing on the ocular surface. We were just changing the lenses. And I got together with a group of contact lens practitioners and we ta started talking about contact lens discomfort. And so many of them say, well, we're going we're gonna to blame the solution. We're going to blame the lenses. And, you know, then we might treat the ocular surface. Well, it's exactly reverse of what it should be. And I realized that because that's the way I approached it. 
is I would see a patient, they'd be uncomfortable with their lenses. I'd see them and I'd, I'd put them into a, a new whiz bang, new contact lens or contact lens solution. I'd see them back in two weeks and the patient said, hey, yeah, this is, this is better. I feel, I feel better. They'd come back another year later and they'd say, you know, my eyes are starting to feel a little bit dry. You got anything new, doc? And I would continually upgrade them realizing that the contact lens is never changed in the equation, but the patient was changing and their ocular surface was changing. MGD compromises the ocular surface health in multiple foreseeable and measurable ways that uh, compromise the comfort of our contact lenses. You know, if you look at the top two reasons for pe reasons people drop out of contact lenses is discomfort and dryness in study after study patient reported reasons, doctor reported reasons, discomfort and dryness. The vast majority of contact lens wearers are under the age of 42. By the age of 42, people that are over the age of 42 only comprise 30% of all of the contact lens wearers on, on the planet. Uh, below that is 70%. So why is it that as they approach 42, they start dropping out of contact lenses? Well, many of them have worn contact lenses for 10, 20, maybe even 30 years at this point, and the ocular surface is just getting pooped out for trying to, trying to you know, compensate. The reality is that they are dropping out because of discomfort and dryness. Another workshop that was put together was the process of people becoming uncomfortable with contact lenses and how they go through this process. And the reality is we need to be protecting the ocular surface as best as we can in order to preserve those contact lens wearers. And I'm gonna share with you some incredible data that shows how we can do that. The Dues 2 report 2017 gave us a step-by-step -step approach for how to treat dry eye from the management to the perspective. And it's an incredible report. I also wanna bring our attention to the Asterisk Corneal Committee and their guidelines for evaluating a patient, certainly before surgery. This is something that as practitioners, uh, we need to be focusing on. And, and the question really was, is how much of a dry eye evaluation do we need to do for all of our patients? What needs to be done? And this corneal committee said, you know, as part of the, uh, the, the ocular surface screening that we would do, just like we do a glaucoma screening on all of our patients, right? We do pressures on all of our patients. That's that is a glaucoma screening. Ocular surface disease is far more common than glaucoma, but what are we doing for an ocular surface screening? And their protocol said that we need to do a questionnaire and they, they like the speed questionnaire. I, I personally am a big fan of the speed questionnaire. There's another one that I utilize in practice as a screening that's called the Sandy questionnaire, S-A-N-D-Y-E. The speed questionnaire does a fantastic job of getting to my bomian gland dysfunction as a primary cause. And then they wanted to look at some signs, particularly looking at some easy markers that we can have our technicians measure. And that would be osmolarity and then inflammatory markers like MMP9 utilizing something like the inflammadry test. And if those patients presented with anything that was positive in that arena, then we might look a little bit closer in our slit lamp evaluation. And uh, they came up with look, lift, pull, push, and then the vital dyes for the patients. And so if we see anything that's questionable with the signs or with the symptoms, then we go a little bit deeper. Those of us that are in a dry eye type of practice, we are automatically looking a little bit deeper into the patient for dry eye. But if, if you're doing comprehensive eye care and you do pressures for glaucoma, you need to have something that is your dry eye screening. And, you know, it could be that you are assessing the blinks and looking at the, you know, the lids and the lashes. You're doing an upper eyelid evaluation. You're assessing the lid laxicity of the patients for something like floppy eyelid syndrome. Um, but then this push perspective, and this is where we're evaluating the meibomian glands. And I, I mean, dating back to optometry school, my slit lamp routine would commonly be that I would, I would push upon the meibomian glands and see what came out. And I really had to admit to myself that when I do that, <laughs> I'm oftentimes doing it um, 
because I'm bored, right? And, you know, squeezing those meibomian glands is just, just kind of a fun thing to do. But what is it doing that's really telling me something about how the patient is? And then considering vital dyes for breakup time and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about this pressure. We know from what we spoke of before that a meibomian gland that is functioning with the force of an eyelid blink yields a liquid secretion. That's, that's a functional meibomian gland. And so if we can somehow simulate that in our practice uh, would, would be an ideal scenario. The, the, the Johnson & Johnson meibomian gland evaluator can be added to the routine. And what it does is it yields 1.25 grams per millimeter squared of pressure, which we know is the, the force of a forceful blink. And if we press upon the meibomian glands with that force, that would be equivalent to what a patient is blinking. And if we see oil secretions coming out, that tells us the patient's glands are functional. Now, I took a meibomian gland expressor just for your, your information, and I pressed it against my middle finger here. And if you just press on your middle finger and you see the skin start to indent, that's about the equivalent amount of pressure that the meibomian gland expressor, the evaluator, pr presses 1.25 grams per millimeter squared. I venture to guess that you're putting more pressure than that with your thumb. It's just a very gentle pressure. And that's the amount of pressure that the eyelid is putting upon itself when it blinks. If you're looking at that and you see that there is six or fewer meibomian glands yielding a liquid secretion, then according to uh, you know uh, some of the experts in the field of MGD, Don Corb, Carolyn Blackie, the patient has MGD. We classify the six to ten category as kind of like the uh, the glaucoma suspect. These are these are suspect patients. If you see a lot of inflammation and you see that they've got eight glands flowing. I'm going to move forward and push them over the edge and say they've got MGD. If they've got nine meibomian glands flowing and everything else in the ocular surface looks perfect, I'm going to watch them closely. They've got 10 to 15 meibomian glands flowing when I evaluate their eyes. I'm going to say they don't have MGD and they're just fine. But it's really critical for us. Most of us in the eye care world know what that 24 pressure is for our ocular hypertension patients, right? That's kind of our cutoff. For meibomian gland dysfunction, that cutoff is six. If you see six or fewer glands flowing, that is a definite has meibomian gland dysfunction. Six to 10 is kind of in this middle ground and 10 or 15 would be where we would be uh, thinking a patient is ideal. So we need to assess the function and, uh, and, and we wanna track to make sure that our treatment is taking a patient from less flow to more flow. And I've said that over the years, as new products are coming onto the market, it doesn't matter what they are, what we need to do in order to say that a patient has been effectively treated for MGD is not gauge it based on their symptoms, but we need to be gauging it based on going from less flow to more flow. We wanna ideally be seeing that the patients see at least a three times increase in the number of meibomian glands yielding a liquid secretion. So if they started with three, we wanna see them get to nine. If they started with six, we wanna see them get to 18. Um, and those are our real, our real uh, knowing that you have seen the increase for it. If we don't treat with meibomian, uh, meibomian gland dysfunction, if we don't get an effective treatment, we know that that obstruction is going to cause something to happen downstream. There's going to be this clogging of that central duct that is going to cause those glands to begin to dilate. It's going to become thicker, 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 and then it's going to start to atrophy and we're going to start to lose those mybocytes, those asini, and the central duct is going to begin to shorten as far as we know. And we can see that with, uh, with mybography. The lippy scan um, and the, the mybography that is, that is put out by Johnson & Johnson is really a, a, a great instrument that is an inexpensive way to bring mybography into your practice. 
but it's kind of the Rolls Royce of my biographers in that it utilizes that is uh, something that's called this dual mode, this three modes of illumination. You can see the dynamic illumination, which you may be familiar with, although that, that image is far better quality. This adaptive transillumination where you use something underneath the eyelid, you can see there's this little handle that is on the head of the device. And then this dual mode DVI where it combines kind of the two together. And that gives you a really good view of what the mybomians are looking like. You can see in these images, the asini, those little pods where the mybocytes are being created. So if you haven't seen this, I encourage you to check it out. Um, also, they have a device that is called the Lippy View 2. When I first bought my instrument eight years ago, I, I purchased this instrument, the, the Lippy View 2. And what it does is it does the mybography, just like the Lippy Scan does. It's a, a little bit of a bigger machine, but it also does two really, really cool things that, um, quite frankly, I, I think... I think should be included in dry eye practices. And that is this lipid layer thickness where it evaluates the total volume and the thickness of the lipid layer. If you wanna know about the barrier function and how protected that ocular surface is, we can measure it and we can find out if it's in the normal range or the abnormal range. And in addition to that, we can do a blink analysis to find out what's happening with the patient's blink, how many of the blinks are complete, how many are partial blinks, and you can slow down the blink for a patient so they can see that they're not closing their eyelids all the way, they're a partial blinker, and that's not going down, grabbing the oil and pulling it up. This, this actually taught me something really interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll bring up a couple of cases that I had, is I had several patients come into the office and they were uncomfortable with their eyes. They, they were just you know miserable with their eyes. And I evaluated their lip, lipid layer thickness using this instrument, and their lipid layer thickness was was quite depressed. It, it wasn't as thick as I anticipated it should be. I looked at their partial blinks and they were horrible blinkers. You know, over the course of the 30 second test or so that it is, these patients blinked four or five times. And of those blinks, maybe one of them was a complete blink. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm gonna need to do lippy flow on these people. They don't have any lipid in their eyes. I went in and I did a mybomian gland expression on them and oil flowed. It was like, you know, we, we struck, we struck gold. It was like, there was oil flowing really, really well. And I got to thinking about that. And I said, you know, if I hadn't known that these people had partial blinks and a lipid layer thickness that was really depressed, I wouldn't have realized that these people need to do blinking exercises. As silly as that was, these symptomatic patients, I sent them home with no treatment other than blinking exercises, where they close their eyes completely, they open them, and they do that for a total of 60 seconds a day. I know that sounds silly. These patients came back to the office, and their lipid layer thickness was far more robust. Their blink analysis was better. It wasn't perfect. And their myeloma gland secretion scores were still fine. Had I not done that for those patients, they would have developed myeloma gland dysfunction because eventually those myeloma glands would have stopped producing. They were on their way to uh, myeloma gland dysfunction, but we saved them because we were able to see the lipid layer thickness and so forth. So once we've identified that these patients have a problem, we move over to the treatment and the subtypes that these patients are, are needing to have. And we refer to the management recommendations of the DOES-2. We evaluate the lid margin and we go with the treatment with LipiFlow, Blefex, or another lid hiding uh, treatment device in omega-3s. And then we can utilize an anti-inflammatory treatment like steroids or cyclosporin or lefetagrass. And, uh, and, and we can utilize something like lippy flow. And as many of you know, lippy flow has been the gold standard for the literature for what we're seeing for an improvement of mybomian gland dysfunction, taking glands from no flow to flow or less flow to more flow. If you're not familiar with what lippy flow is, it's this device right here. You can get this device plus the lippy scan for around $36,000 
when I bought it, it was known as the hundred thousand dollar machine. Uh, now it's you know a fraction of the price it was back when we started treating patients. Um, but I would go back and pay that price again for it if I if I had to. Um, Twelve minute in office, it removes gland obstruction by treating the inner lid with heat. And so that's a unique thing about LipiFlow is that it's the only device that heats the inner eyelid with heat. All the other devices heat the outer eyelids. And as we know from that, from the anatomy picture that we had, there's a lot of things that take that heat away from the meibomian glands, including the cornea, which absorbs that heat. So having something that protects the ocular surface, it utilizes this activator, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner, which creates a cup around the, the sclera and the cornea, protecting it from any of the heat. The outer portion of that cup will heat up the outer, uh, excuse me, the inner portion of the eyelid, heating the meibomian glands, and then applying a gentle peristaltic expression that, uh, that with the heat, uh, you know, will liquefy the obstruction um, and then remove it from the glands. There's no medication that's required in the procedure. Uh, most practices utilize an anesthetic when they first put the activators into the eye. And um, there, I, I can't think that there has been one patient that I have not been able to get the activators in their eyes. There's one patient that I shouldn't have put them in, but the patient was very persistent. And we did, we got them in, it was no problem. And the patient did really, really well, but it was really difficult to get the activators in. So that was one patient out of the uh, eight years or so that we've done. Safe and effective for every gland and every lid for every patient. Um, the thing about this is that it's been a, around for so long that it's become the gold standard. 400,000 treatments, seven prospective randomized controls studies, 30 or more at this point review, peer-reviewed publications. And, um, you know, we, we need to see that there are peer-reviewed publications for these treatments that our patients are using and over 10 years of research. One of those research papers is just looking at the effectiveness of this. And um, this is a one year study. And uh, my concept around doing lippy flow is that I would need to do it two or three or four times a year. And I was wrong in that. And uh, there were studies that were dating out to three years. There's four year studies that look at patients that have had lippy flow. But even in this is the one year study of having that baseline six meibomian glands yielding liquid secretions. And what do we want to see? We want to see a three times increase in the glands when we know that a treatment is effective. And we see that this patient had, what the, this group of patients went from six to 18 glands. And that was uh, existent for all the way out to 12 months. So does a patient need to be retreated? You know, some of them do. Some are really bad patients. We treat them every six to 12 months. Most patients don't need to be retreated again, uh, but some of them desire to be. And as the cost of lippy flow has come down considerably, I mean, again, I, you know, I, when I bought this machine, it was you know, a lot more expensive than it is now. And the treatment costs are really affordable for patients. So now we can treat patients more frequently than we could years ago. I was fortunate enough to be involved in this particular study that Dr. Blackie published as the lead author. And this is what was a difficult study to recruit for because our patients basically had to be very uncomfortable wearing their contact lenses and uh, really be able to wear them, you know, for, for four hours. Uh, it, but push forward and be in wearing them for eight hours. So these are patients who wear their contact lenses for eight hours or more, but reported a really decreased comfortable contact lens wearing time. And what we were able to do is we were able to substantially increase the number of comfortable contact lens hours that they were able to wear them by four hours. Uh, the, 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 the control group, we treated them after three months, and we showed that even in that group, we were able to get a four-hour increase in, in their wearing time. Certainly, we see some improvements in cataract surgery. This particular subgroup, uh, his, um, uh, you, you see here the treatment group, how they improved their comfort, and the patients who were untreated, how their pain and discomfort scores substantially increased and uh, certainly something we don't want to see for our patients. 
So over the years, I've had an opportunity to talk one on one with many people. And some of the questions that they ask is what I wish I knew when I started with Lippy Flow is one that we're going to see a three times increase in the number of my bone glands yielding liquid secretions. Um, it's not going to be a one and done. The patient gets this treatment and, you know, we've solved every problem in the world. Uh, but it is something that recreates that barrier function for them. And usually about six to eight weeks later, they're going to start to see that the meibomian gland secretion scores are improving. And usually about that time, the patient's starting to see some improvement in their symptoms. But that's not our measure for success. You haven't heard me talk about symptoms at all, really. Our measure for success is, uh, is, is really my booming gland liquid secretions. And the question is, is there any potential pitfalls to avoid when adding lippy flow? And that's just it. Don't promise a symptomatic improvement. These patients have a nerve disease of their cornea where their cornea is in pain and they have this dry eye symptom. By improving the ocular surface, that does not mean you're automatically gonna improve the symptoms. But what we can do is we can improve the function of the tears. And by doing that, the patient is now on a pathway to recovery. And about 91% of them feel some sort of improvement when they have done lippy flow. How do you talk to your patients about MGD and lippy flow? Well, first of all, I talk about, do we want to improve the function of their tears? And do we want to get them back to a, a level of homeostasis? That's going to be our objective with our treatments and their glands are clogged. They're not flowing. And I show them an image of the mybographer. And I say that unless we do something to resolve this obstruction, these glands are going to continue to atrophy and both your symptoms as well as the severity of your dry eye is going to get worse. So what does an ideal lippy flow patient look like to you? It's somebody who is having less than 10 meibomian glands, but certainly less than six meibomian glands yielding a liquid secretion with that 1.25 grams per millimeter squared of pressure, just like we can see with the meibomian gland expressor or with a gentle press of your fingers. And then we set expectations that symptoms aren't going to improve right away, but we hope to see the improve. But more importantly, we want to improve the function of the tear film as things go on. So the biggest changes that we've made to implement lens is to our office is we consider everybody to have dry eye and we look at them very closely to make sure 40% of our patients don't know that they have dry, 40% of our patients showing up to the office have MGD and many of them don't know that they have it. Certainly something we can stop the disease before it happens and, uh, and really get this. How do we know it's working? And what does measuring success look like? Measuring success is not symptoms, although many of them feel a symptomatic improvement. Measuring success is in a three times increase in the number of meibomian glands yielding liquid secretions. And time and time again, we see that with lippy flow. Regardless of what you're using to treat MGD, you need to see that three times increase and I would encourage you to have a high standard for the number of meibomian gland improvement for the patients that you have. So I thank, I thank you so much for, for listening in. I think that as you uh, continue this journey of MGD, you're going to see that, uh, that it's a, a true barrier. And, and once we create that strong barrier function for the ocular surface, you know, our patients are on the road to recovery and can really do a great job of improving the ocular surface, realizing that it's that barrier that we need to be creating for our patients for continual improvement. Thanks for listening in. Hope you have a great rest of the meeting.